All right. I think we have uh, a couple of uh, participants joined, and in the interest of time, we'll get started. Let me welcome everyone to the webinar. Once again, I'm Edward Kataika, and I'm Director of Programs at the Exa Health Community. This is another webinar, the second in a series that will be organizing for the Exa Health Economics Community of Practice, and it is supported by the Translance Program. The Exa Health Economics Community of Practice provides a platform for continuous learning and sharing of knowledge on health economics related matters, mainly to its members from the nine Exa countries. These are typically from economics and related backgrounds and are, are drawn from ministers of health and academic institutions of the member countries. The platform also allows for interaction between the health economists from our region and their peers from other regions on the continent and beyond. We organize webinars on topics that are of interest to the region as part of the knowledge sharing in the community of practice. So today's topic is on digital health. In the last few decades, the world has, has and continues to witness rapid development of digital technologies whose applications have been adopted across all sectors, including health. These technologies have immense potential for providing the efficiency of health systems, for improving the efficiency of health systems and the delivery of health care. Yet there are so many issues that ought to be considered by the health sector as we embrace digital technologies and its wide range of applications across the health system and healthcare services. Our panelists in the webinar will delve into some of the key issues relating to digital health, including its scope and potential. They will, in the process, share examples of how digital technologies are being employed in some EXA member countries. So we have four panelists today, and I'm going to introduce them. We have Dr. Rosalind Parks Rantashi, who will give us an overview of the subject matter, the digital health. And Rosalind is a clinical academic, researcher, and lecturer at the Infectious Diseases Institute, Makerere University in Uganda, and the School of Public Health, University of Cambridge in the UK. She's also director of the Ugandan Academy of Health Innovation and Impact, and her research interests are in sustaining HIV and STI care and other health care using using digital innovations. We also have Dr. Martin Balaba, who will give us the second presentation. And Martin is a medical doctor at the Infectious Diseases Institute, Makerere University, Uganda. He's, a, he's the medical lead on new and emerging technologies Uganda, at the Uganda Academy for Health, Innovation and Impact. He will talk about two digital health innovations the ART access, which through digital health records enable patients to pick up ART drugs from private pharmacies rather than clinics, and call for life and text and, and call messaging services that support adherence and retention in medical care. The third presenter is Dr. Dominic Nkoma, who will give us the Malawi experience of digital health and Dominic is a lecturer at the College of Medicine, University of Malawi, and the research lead at the Health Economics and Policy Unit, HEPU, in Malawi. Prior to joining the College of Medicine, he worked for many years for the government of Malawi in the planning department of the Minister of Health. And I'll say I was privileged to work with him in the planning department. He also worked as chief economist in the Minister of Agriculture and is currently on secondment from government to HEPO. So he will talk to us about the health management information systems in Malawi and its potential use in healthcare purchasing arrangements. Then after these presentations, we will have a commentary and this will be given by Dr. Simon Walker. And Simon is a senior research fellow at the Center for Health Economics, University of York. He specializes in economic evaluation of healthcare interventions from treatments to system strengthening activities. He will speak to us about economic methods 
to evaluate the cost effectiveness of digital health and innovations. So I will be inviting uh, Rosalind to give us uh, the overview, but I think just uh, one housekeeping uh, announcement to, to our participants. When we get to the question and answer, we will make use of the raise hand uh, feature on the, which we have there. So I think if you want to speak, just raise your hand and you'll be recognized and you'll speak. Otherwise, you can use the Q&A button to just type your question if you need to communicate with the, with the panelists before we go to the Q&A session. So for now, let me invite uh, Rosalind to give us the overview of, on the digital health. Rosalind, please. So good uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope for most people it's afternoon. Um, um, as mentioned, my name's Rosalind Abratanchi, and I'm just going to give an overview on some of the opportunities that uh, we have, perhaps have in the area of digitalization. So this map, um, actually, um, my daughter um, showed me this map because um, in her school, they had to do the 10 most important maps that have ever been made. And this Facebook map came up as one of the 10 most important maps. And really what it's showing is that all of the connections that Facebook have across the world, but in a way it can be used as a proxy for really, you know, global internet use and, and, and digitalization. And different to the map of 10 years ago, this map of, I think, 2019 really shows that East and Southern Africa um, is glowing up white um, in, in this map, showing that we really are digitally connected to the rest of the world. And this speed of digital uh, digitalization has been extraordinarily fast. Uh, this graph shows um, some of the other innovations and technology adaptions that have happened in the 20th and 21st century. So the green is radio, the blue is the car, red is TVs, color TVs. And really those took quite a few years to go from um, you know, limited usage to, to almost 100% usage. Whereas if you look at all of the things that have happened, oh, sorry, um, personal computers, the internet, smartphone, social media usage, tablets, all of these have had much, 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 much steeper trajectories showing that we really are in, in, in a digital age. And so, you know, the question is, um, you know, where is Africa in this and, and how is Africa doing? Well, it would appear that actually um, our, our new technologies are probably leapfrogging over old ones. So this uh, map shows in dark red um, the, the countries and the places where the um, electricity um, uh, access is limited. So dark red means that uh, access is limited to um, less than 25% of the population. But if you look where the dark red are, the penetration of mobile phones is higher than the penetration of electricity. So already the new technology, even though the phones may have to be charged by, by solar, the phones are, are, are really in people's hands um, and people are, are getting access to them when they need them and, and, and want them. And so this leads us to opportunities for transforming activities. So everybody knows the story of mobile money. Um, we're all very aware uh, um, of this. And, um, you know, it really goes to show that, that an initiative and a technology and a system that is uh, relevant for Africa will be readily adapted. So the graph on the right hand side shows the number of new uh, mobile phone, sorry, mobile money registrations. And as you can see, the, the demand in sub-Saharan Africa just keeps on increasing. Yet, you know, with the exception of South Asia, these technologies are really not being picked up um, abroad. So what's interesting to me is why we haven't had in health 
a similar transformative activity like we've had in financing and, and with mobile money and why that might not be happening and what this transformation might look like in terms of digital health. So health data is exploding. So in 2013, um, if all the healthcare records in the world were on those um, uh, stack of tablets, so, um, you know, like a normal iPad or a little tablet, these tablets could fill up 75% of a thousand bed hospital. Or alternatively, it would reach about 5,500 miles to the moon. In the last seven years, we are now a third of the way to the moon from 3%. And we could fill a thousand hospital, uh, sorry, uh, 11 hospital uh, hospitals with all of the data that we have. And the growth of data is about 48% per year. So this is a massive explosion in health data across the globe. But on top of that, um, or because of that, or, be, or, or related to that, we also have a massive increase in computer power. So I'm sure many of you have heard of Moore's law, which is that computer power will double every year. And that happened up until the early part of, of, of 2010. Yet um, the capacity that we have in computing power has just started to take off much, 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 much deep, more steeply, which means that our ability to analyze these huge data sets and the speed of analysis is much greater than it ever was before. And on top of that, so, so that's the computer power, that's the, the, the transformative ways that we are, uh, our humans are, are thinking novelly around things, but also how we communicate is different. There are over 2.2 billion users of Facebook and even YouTube, which is really the method that most young people get most of their TV and images has over a billion users. So we also within health have to be aware of these shifts um, in communication and the shifts in ways interact with people uh, globally. So what is digital health? Um, so Simon and Paul asked me about this the other day and they were saying, what is digital health? Well, um, sorry, if we go to this part of me thinks, and, and, and often I find it, it useful to say, well, can we su substitute the word digital for paper? Or can we su substitute the word paper for digital? Because in a lot of things that we're doing, that's all that digital health is. We're putting, an electronic system or a digital system where we would have paper uh, records. So the World Health Assembly in, in 2018 really passed a resolution to say that, that, that digital health was here to stay and that we should get on board. And their feeling uh, was that recognizing the potential of digital uh, technologies to advance the sustainable development goals and support health systems in all countries with health promotion, disease prevention, accessibility, quality, and affordability of services. And, you know, with our interest in, in, in health economics, the quality and the affordability is obviously uh, very, very, very important. So what are digital health initiatives? So I find it, and, and, and there's lots of different characterizations. I'm going to just uh, tell you about mine, but, but the, the way I think about it and find it easy, but um, there are lots of different systems emerging on how people categorize things. I think we can think of it in three ways. The first one is e-health. So these tend to be web-based activities. So in our system, and you'll hear in a minute about electronic medical records, this is web-based stock management. In the current COVID outbreak, it's been surveillance, epidemiological tools. What we see a massive increase in in Uganda, and I'm sure elsewhere in, in, in the region, um, is we see a lot of work around supporting community health workers, VHTs, websites and tablets based activities that support the community health workers and an increasing e-learning. So online training platforms for, for healthcare workers. Then we have what we would call M Health initiatives. So these are ones that are delivered primarily through mobile phone. And these can either be your kind of dumb phone that's not internet um, based, but it could also be a smartphone that, that has a data connection and is connected to the internet. 
So the sorts of activities in, in mHealth include text messages, interactive voice response, um, uh, patient information apps designed for mobile. So again, another massive growth area in COVID, you know, self-diagnosis and, and, and contact tracing by mobile phone that we've seen um, around the world. And telemedicine. Telemedicine has grown massively during the COVID outbreak. Um, and telemedicine could be through telephone or, or through a computer, um, but, but also through the phone. So then there are other technologies which aren't really digital technologies, but tend to get lumped together under digital health initiatives. And these include a whole range of things such as drones, wearable devices such as blood pressure monitors that people walk around with, implants um, uh, such as um, insulin um, implants that may be able to release a small amount of, of, of insulin or other medication, electronic pills and pill caps. So electronic pills that you know um, can tell if you swallowed them, they have an imprint on them or caps on the top of bottles so that people know if the bottle top has been opened remote uh, sensors, so things that, that do things related to health. So for example, um, pollution censoring, um, so that we know where people might have a risk of asthma attacks, GIS mapping, and then AI and machine learning, which is a big catch-all for, you know, really the massive enhanced computer's power that's taking the way I see it is taking our traditional statistics and really applying the power of very big computers with very big data sets to enable us to, to come up with uh, understanding our health data better. And so the WHO has classified things slightly differently. They've started with where these systems work. So they've divided it into clients, healthcare providers, managers, and data services. But as you can see, you can't read all the small print here because there are so many different options. So really digital health is a kind of catch all for a lot of different systems activities that are, that are, that are happening. And I think after a while, like the word paper has become irrelevant from, you know, we don't really talk about, you know, um, so much about paper-based records unless we're comparing them to something else. So I think over time we'll start to lose the, the use of the word digital because everything will naturally become uh, digitalized. So what are the challenges with digital health? What are the concerns? Well, in reality, although it, it, you know, we see very nice pictures of what digital health looks like, these are, you know, this is the reality on the ground for most of us. Like these are the sorts of systems that we're navigating, getting our stuff around on boat or by bicycle. And it's, and it's difficult to conceptualize how we can jump from this to, to where we need to go. These are our paper records. This is, I mean, and I'm sure many of you have seen multiple, multiple health centers that look exactly like this. Now, this is quite nicely organized because they're organized by color, but you know, there's, there's an enormous amount of work that would need to be done to, to digitalize these systems. But once done, you know, it would be a, a much, 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 much more efficient and productive and helpful way of, of looking after our patient data. But we still have internet gaps. I mean, this is a little bit old, this picture, but uh, and, and I think it's improved a lot since here, but it still shows that there's quite a big gap um, uh, without internet across the continent. And data maturity. So this is where we would need to go with our data. Um, and most of us, most countries will be in the stage one, two, and three. So we're either analytically impaired, which is that we don't have data-driven organizations and we don't have the data available, or we have localized analytics happening at a uh, local um, health center level, but potentially not nationally, or at a national level, but potentially not at a health center level. And, but we could have analytic aspirations. So we could be moving or trying to move in the right directions or some people within our organizations and our, our governments are trying to move in this direction, but not everybody is on board. Really, we need to be getting towards this analytical nirvana, as this is called, where really we're using our data strategically um, to, to show us what to do. Another potential issue we have is our regulatory and legal frameworks. 
you know, sometimes people think that lack of regulation means that it's a free for all and people can just do what they want. But lack of regulation also stops people doing their work because we're sometimes told, well, you need to wait till the regulations are out. You can't do this because we don't have a regulation or we don't have a, uh, um, uh, the, the rules in place to allow you to do that. And we don't know how to manage your activities because there is no framework. We're getting better, so this is a couple of years old. Uganda definitely has a data protection bill, and I think Kenya and Tanzania do now. But you know, these are some of the challenges that, that, that we come across. And so what are other challenges? Well, often it's uncoordinated. There's lots of different actors and programs. People have different projects that they're given money for, um, which they're doing in isolation and in siloed and even across the sectors we're siloed. So health might be doing something, agriculture might be doing something else. We have this thing called pilotitis where basically we run a lot of little pilots and they don't go anywhere. They either die in the water or they don't get further funding or, but, but we're also um, not, um, uh, not evaluating them in a, in a rigorous manner. Inflexible fundings and designs. So sometimes, you know, these are creative uh, processes. Sometimes the funding doesn't allow the creativity um, in order to really come up with the solutions. Inefficient policies and practices. Well, this is a risk for everything we do, I guess. Um, and lack of participation and representation, making sure that the end user is consulted, be that a patient, a healthcare worker, a district health officer, that they really understand and want and need the type of um, tools that we're digitalization. So really principles are needed around this because they synthesize the existing evidence, create a common vision and institutionalize lessons learned. So there are some principles for digital development and I've put the links to this in the end. But these really outline how we should be going about digital innovation and what we should be thinking about. So finally, this is my last slide. So I'm sure some of you have heard of the dark web. This is where um, illegal drugs get sold. This is where a lot of criminal activity uh, goes on, which is the, the side of the internet which is not available to the public. This is where data gets sold. And medical data is worth three times more than financial data. And this to me is a real indication of how valuable our health data is. It's one of our most precious assets for our, our countries, for us as individuals, for, for organizations. And it really has the power to transform our, our health system. Um, so we need to take it seriously um, and we need to look after it. Thank you so much. Um, there are a list of resources, some, some links to WHO documents, strategies, um, the East Africa um, readiness report for interoperability and, and some EU uh, documents here. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Rosalind, for that uh, overview presentation. Very interesting indeed. Uh, we'll move on to the second presentation and uh, I will now invite Dr. Martin Balaba to give us uh, his uh, presentation. Martin, please. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. All right, I hope my presentation is clear. I'm Dr. Yes. Martin Balaba and I work with uh, Dr. Rosalind at uh, the Academy at IDI. I uh, will be going through one of our technologies that we've been using to support um, HIV care within Kampala. We piloted this and we plans are underway to scale this, this um, technology. So what I'm presenting is called ART Access and it's built on the backbone of what we call um, the Community Pharmacy Refill Program. That is uh, a differentiated service care delivery model we, that I'm sure most of you are conversant with. Um, just a little background, um, IDI is funded by PEPFA, five-year grant, and it's under health system stre strengthening, and currently supporting about 141 health facilities with about 207,000 people on ART. And all these facilities are operating different uh, DSDM models. 
uh, it's important to note that within these health facilities, uh, we are realizing that 92.6% of the clients are achieving viral suppression. However, they were still accessing their care at these facilities um, despite the suppression. And so with the volume of, of patients coupled with other challenges that these health facilities uh, have that are beyond just HIV, IDI came up with the concept of uh, partnering with community pharmacies where large volumes of patients were coming. And rather than having these clients who are stable and suppressed going to the health facility, they came up with this partnership where clients would pick their drugs in the community pharmacy, which was closer to the patient's homes than going to the health facilities. So it's a voluntary model and our clients who are meeting the criteria of viral suppression, um, viral suppression, they're, all, they're more than 20 years old. They don't have any OIs, they're not pregnant, no child in care. The good adherence of more than 40 of 95% would be sent, would be told about this program to which they would sign. And how it runs is if today is day zero for you seeing the clinician at the facility, your next two uh, pickups will be within the community pharmacy and not at the facility. And then on month six, you go back to the facility to do your annual checkups to make sure you're still you know, suppressed and adhering to the treatment and making sure you other parameters that make you eligible for the program are still as it was before. So the enrollment and consenting of the clients and the entire running of the program was paper-based. So when you come into the clinic that you told about the program, if you sign up, they will tell you the pharmacy within your area where you would much rather pick your RRT than the facility. And so different forms capture your eligibility. And then these will be taken to IDI offices, um, entered into an access database. And at the access database, uh, you'd be, you'd, the system generates a pharmacy attendance register, which an IDI employed nurse would now carry to their respective pharmacy and wait for the clients to, to come. So in this model, uh, IDI was employing refill pharmacy uh, nurses to sit within the respective pharmacies that had signed up to this program. And so everything to do with the movement of data and updating of the systems in terms of transactions at the facility and the community pharmacy when clients stand up for their ART was all paper-based. So much as this was a solution, it, it still presented some challenges that we had to navigate. You realize that everything was paper-based and the movement of paper from facility to IDI you now, the registers for pharmacy attendancy are carried to the respective pharmacy. There is no real-time aspect to monitoring um, the data. If clients are turning up in the event that papers are lost in between, the movements, um, monitoring logis logistics is very, very hard. But also importantly, you wouldn't know in real time what was happening to your clients within um, the community pharmacy until they came back on month six. So upon this background, we came up with ART Access, which is an application developed with MRC DFID Welcome Trust um, Fund under the Health Systems Strengthening. And here we developed an application that would transform the processes that were paper-based into, into a digital platform that would function in real time, giving the health facility access to see in real time what is happening to their clients who are picking up their ART. And also the program administrators who sit at IDI would have a real time understanding of the transactions at the facility and also in the community pharmacies and the aspects that are very critical in this were, you know, uh, which patient is lost to follow up, who is missing their visit, uh, who has now fallen out of the criteria now and now has been, you know, uh, discontinued from the program and, and taken back to the health facility for more comprehensive clinical management. So um, this is the conceptual framework that we came up with, what is currently the status, what are the effects of all these? And then we went into uh, the intervention principles of developing a model to decongest the centers. And our approach was 
have rigorous or call it iterative interaction with the key stakeholders that we are intending to develop this application for because in the end it really matters that the people who are supposed to use these systems inform their development so we we did a human centered design stroke iterative process of development of the application with the nurses and other stakeholders who are going to be using this system um, this is just a brief iterative process that we went through and how it is currently is a client from a facility identifies i is attached to a to a specific pharmacy or let me say a particular facility identifies pharmacies within the community that will be receiving their clients under this program and so again I, as i'll be explaining later that clients are sent into the community for this particular um program and so again this is providing us an opportunity to to think uh differently to make sure that the system is more robust so a client can only pick up their drugs at the designated pharmacy so in the lockdown there was an opportunity to actually um break this barrier as i'll be explaining later so the system has different components uh looking at the pharmacy at the health facility and the admin it's web based with a phone version that is yet to be approved by the ministry so these are just different um landing pages for the different sections pharmacy facility uh and the admin and critical is the fact that here you can you know easily generate reports without you having to go through the tedious process of analyzing paper and putting things together so we started developing the app in 2017 we rolled out in 2019 january and currently there are six pharmacies do uh, which were implementing the community refill program under the paper based system and one when we were rolling out this application we chose to go for three pharmacies and leave the three running paper based uh, systems for comparative purposes to do some analysis that we shall be discussing later and these three pharmacies are attached to two facilities and currently more than 50 to 50 percent of clients have been transferred onto the application we did a simple analysis of time in motion and client interaction with the clinician with a refill pharmacy uh, nurse when picking up rt uh, was significantly reduced with at access compared to when it's paper so we have um plans to we plans to uh evaluate the applications are underway we have uh, a qualitative paper that is we are working out we are working on currently and that is because during the the development of the application we undertook an observational study to understand what exactly goes into developing these technologies for for healthcare what what are the thoughts and feelings of the users the, the the patients and the different stakeholders that you know finally inform the development of a tool that can be taken up by the system so we have different aspects uh, that are qualitative and quantitative that uh, we are going to be looking at we're working with paula and simon to do some health economics um evaluation on the system so our next steps is we are going to do more you know time in motion and understand the different aspects of um, being served on the application compared to the paper-based system uh we're doing um a quantitative and qualitative analysis plans are underway already with the ministry and some other implementing partners to scale the application and also develop uh, a stock management module we imagine that with the pandemic came the fact that such people were caught up in different parts of the country and much as this was innovative enough someone who was attached to a particular pharmacy still could not um pick drugs to any far at any near pharmacy so the plans of art access is to make sure we break the barriers and make sure we have inter-facility communication in that a client who is anywhere doesn't need to be within their home area they can even if i stay in a different area i work in a different area you can walk into any pharmacy that is under art access and you pick your drugs and all that information is captured and centrally reflects 
So that we need um, unique identifiers to be used and conversations already underway to see how we can um, make the system very dynamic and flexible. So for the project, uh, these are uh, our partners and funders. I would request to go to the next presentation. Is that okay? Yes. You have another presentation? Yes, there are two. Ah, okay. there are, there are two. I yeah. didn't want to mix them so that we create, uh, people can follow the different okay. projects. Yes, let's get the second presentation. All right, um, just a minute, let me share this. So the second technology that we have is called Call for Life. Um, so Call for Life is a tool that um, is an IVR tool that uses the efficient automated case surveillance uh, to follow up people for different aspects of their health. So how Call for Life started is by IVR, sorry, I didn't explain what IVR is. IVR is interactive voice response. And so the tool, the tool was initially used to follow up HIV clients in our clinic, uh, sending them symptom reminders, adherence reminders, uh, visit reminders. And all this, we expected it to help clients to be retained in care and also achieve viral suppression. So, how the system works briefly, it initiates a call to a patient, uh, the patient listens to pre-recorded options and then responds to different um, instructions in the prompts. Given the diversity of our population, the messages are in diverse languages that give us good geographical cover of the entire language. So in 2015, this is just a chronology of how we embraced, it, we piloted a system um, and uh, by that time we called it Tamil, but over time we have been able to contextualize this particular system for different um, responses. You can see in 2015, we had just a pilot, then we had an RCT on the tool. Then in 2017, we started um, the clients, we started on a lighter version of the, the system. So instead of them receiving daily reminders was now customized to a certain uh, number of symptoms once a week. And then we moved into um, customizing the system for different aspects of health that were realizing that this could have an impact like TB, we did an RCT on TB, then the youth. Um, and currently we were able to, we have been able to and are still going on with COVID response using the same technology, but the module is, is, the foundation is still the same, but the technology is very adaptable to different responses. And currently we have been supporting the ministry in uh, the, the response in COVID. So like I said, it is in different languages. So you can see on this map, um, the different modules and where they are being piloted, where these studies are taking place. Uh, you can see that currently we are doing surveillance of Call for Life, using Call for Life for COVID in West Nile, and there are different languages. Uh, so for HIV, where we were, we were um, using the system for HIV, uh, it was at different sites, and these are just different, these are the variables for the clients that we enrolled onto the system. And so this is a, uh, this shows you this, the call success rate. Usually when you pilot some of these technologies, it's, it's very important to understand, you know, how people interact with them and how do you measure the, their responsiveness to, to these technologies. It is critical to understand that with this technology, it does not need a smartphone. Any phone can be used for call for life. So that gave us a good success rate because good response from our clients because it did not segregate against who could use or not the system. So this shows you uh, the call success rate uh, from 2016. 
2019 October for the different projects. And here you can see the different um, tips that clients were, were asking for. So all the registers are up for like general information, ARVs and adherence, breastfeeding, HIV information, positive living. And so the objective of Call for Life Youth, which we was another module, was to, we realize in my clinical practice, and Dr. Rose will uh, test to this, youth are a very special group. And so we needed to think through how can we break the barriers in them accessing care. And so we thought that using Call for Life uh, to help us access the acceptability of this tool for HIV adherence support, um, and then initiating ART, and also to evaluate uh, the cost of Call for Life adherence tool in comparison to the standard of care where, client, where these youth were just coming into the clinic. And so these were some of the objectives of Call for Life youth. So this has been delayed due to COVID. Um, it's being undertaken by Dr. Agnes, who is a PhD student at the Academy. However, site initiation has been successfully done by August 2020. And um, 88 young adults with HIV screened and 21 have been enrolled so far. And the target is 178. Call for Life TB, again, um, broadly is to, is to measure the outcomes of TB treatment using Call for Life to enhance support for treatment uh, of these clients to know that if we give more uh, support to clients on TB when they're taking their medication, does the tool help them with reminding them to take their pills? Uh, do we achieve success in terms of um, the, the treatment success rate compared to the standard of care when you know you just go to the clinic, receive your drugs, and nothing else happens compared to once you receive your drugs, we use Call for Life to follow you up and give you uh, tips and remind you to take your tablets. So this is broadly about Call for Life TB. It's at three sites. Um, with a sample size of 274 patients. They're followed up at month zero, two and six. Uh, we have some delays due to COVID, but um, the study initiation has been done. A similar project is up in Karamoja. Um, it's a USAID funded implementation program on TB outcomes in Karamoja using the tool. Call for Life COVID uh, is a module of Call for Life that the ministry that has been supporting the response to COVID to the, to the Ministry of Health and how it started was we initially worked with the different pillars of the Ministry of Health uh, and we voiced content for the different categories that the ministry was uh, following up given the dynamic shifts in COVID. So initially it was the high risk travelers, then we had we went into supporting those in quarantine, then along the way people who had received treatment for COVID and settling into communities was becoming hard because of stigma. And so they were having so many challenges settling into communities. So we worked with the psychosocial pillar at MOH to create content that we would use to support the different people who had been discharged uh, from COVID treatment units. So the content is approved by MOH. Uh, it's inter our system is integrated with the MOH alerts management system. So in case of any red flag, immediately MOH is notified, the district surveillance team is notified and response is guided. It's also in different languages and it's managed by IDI medical doctors in that once our red flag, if the system picks up a red flag, our doctors triage the alert to make sure that actually what we send to the ministry for response is guided by our triage. That's why it's very critical that our medical doctors are the ones responding to this. So, like I said, between April to uh, currently, we are doing um, quarantine support. Currently, we're in West Nile. And so, we started with high risk travelers. And during this period, we followed about 672 clients for over 14 days as per the SOPs. And then, starting August, we were requested to focus on West Nile. And these are the 10 districts that we've been covering. By the time we shifted to West Nile, we had covered 10 districts uh, beyond just West Nile. Uh, case management, or what you can call psychosocial support, is for those who have been discharged from, quarant from treatment centers to settle into communities. So we follow them up 
post discharge um and then we but before we do that because the capacity of the people who treat them needed to be trained on what the tool is and how to register their clients as they're being discharged so we trained a couple of of CTUs within the country um, and they have been actively adding clients as they've been discharged and so our system um, sends out calls to the clients upon discharge and any alert that we receive that that would signal follow up by the respective ministry pillars is shared with the ministry in real time so these are the numbers of CTUs that we've trained so far and are active on the system uh, this is just a summary of uh, the calls from the different categories of people who've been following up with our system and also healthcare workers. We've been able to follow up our own institutional healthcare workers. Yes, so that is it about Call for Life. Uh, it's a very dynamic system and very adaptable to any response to challenges in healthcare, as you can see. Thank you so much. I hope I kept time. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Martin, for those uh, two presentations. Uh, we will move on to the third one, and I will now invite uh, Dominic to give us uh, his presentation on Malawi. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thanks, Edward. Uh, yeah, so, I, yeah, I'll present, um, so I'm Dominic Koma, I, 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 as Edward uh, uh, introduced. Uh, I'll present on uh, 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 yeah, so I'll present on, on, on uh, how we can think about the, the uh, op op optimizing the use of, of uh, digital technology, particularly in the context of um, strengthening uh, existing health management information systems, uh, using uh, a case study of, of based on a, 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 an assessment we did on behalf of government, and then also using another case study demonstrate uh, uh, how choices uh, are, are among competing competing uh, uh, tools could, could could become a complex complex issue requiring probably uh, uh, principles uh, uh, of economics yeah so uh, I think I want to repeat uh, in terms of the background so uh, uh, in the uh, background around uh, te digital technology and how they're useful, uh, as you've, you've noted from the two presentations. Uh, but in the context of the study that we did, uh, uh, we I'll, I'll try and focus on on, on uh, uh, the quickly uh, how lack of uh, of decision needs and and also uh, proliferation of digital solutions can lead to complex uh, uh, um, uh, uh, processes for uh, in terms of decision making uh, on what to, what technology to adopt uh, so I'll, I'll, as i pointed out I'll, I'll, I'll motivate based on the assessment on the uh, hmis for for Focusing on central hospitals, but then uh, uh, argue that the same process could then be uh, used towards the, uh, 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 strengthening the entire HMIS architecture. Uh, yeah, so for the assessment, uh, the HMIS assessment. Uh, This was motivated by a study uh, which aimed to uh, identify uh, whether 
the current HMIS could lead to, uh, could support a reform government is, is undertaking, uh, 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 provider uh, autonomy and, uh, and uh, yeah, provider autonomy and uh, uh, provider payment reform. However, in the process, uh, uh, it was necessary to review the data systems that are available. Uh, and it's within that framework that we uh, 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 navigated around uh, 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 the role of uh, optimal digitization uh, to support uh, efficient decision making at, uh, at a provide at the central hospital level. Uh, and then the second uh, 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 part of my presentation would then uh, uh, try to use uh, uh, various assessments done by DITRI on behalf of government uh, on uh, a specific uh, 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 process uh, for the uh, community health management information system uh, where they are in the process to recommend uh, or, or government is in the process of, of deciding whether to abandon uh, the, not abandoning, but to utilize a new uh, inter platform uh, uh, over beyond uh, and of, in the process, of course, abandoning the current DHMIS or HMIS or DHIS2 uh, for a particular application of the community health system. Yeah, so I'll qu just quickly run through the uh, our our findings. So, uh, so generally, uh, our study started by assessing the org organogram of the hospital, uh, and so where we see that there are clinical decisions to be made, but as you can see also uh, at the level of the director. Uh, there are also administrative uh, uh, decisions, managerial decisions beyond clinical, uh, particularly decisions about who is accessing what, what, and then how are we producing the services of at what cost? And uh, yeah, so efficiency decisions and whether the services are of, of, of acceptable quality. Uh, these are beyond uh, what current uh, uh, technology to the. the digital platforms uh, uh, attempt to, to, to uh, uh, give guidance on. And, uh, and uh, if you see the mapping down there, uh, uh, we can divide uh, uh, hospital information as that within the realm of uh, clinical decision making. Uh, so outpatient, inpatient, uh, other support uh, systems, radiology, laboratory, pharmacy, theater, but also for optimal decision making at the hospital level, uh, you need a lot of information ranging from information technology, HMIS procurement, internal audit, uh, uh, maintenance, and then uh, uh, other uh, services, for example, performance of the mortuary, uh, uh, efficiency of the catering uh, uh, services, and then uh, uh, information around financing and, and general administration and, and human resources. And so, uh, 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 clearly you then see that the information set that uh, uh, management of the hospital need to uh, run the hospital and achieve the goals uh, for, for simplicity of universal health coverage within the hospital setup is a lot more than just clinical information. And this has been the motivation for the work uh, that we, we were currently doing. Yeah, so uh, part of the uh, uh, assessment then involved reviewing uh, the information systems available at the central hospital to support uh, uh, to support this complex uh, 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 structure, which requires complex information uh, systems. Uh, in summary, I guess what you see there, uh, 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 even within the setup of uh, uh, tertiary hospitals, a proliferation of, 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 of systems that are not connected. Uh, 
So we had systems, uh, the DHS2, uh, which is a main system for government, uh, the main uh, uh, digital platform for, for uh, the HMIS, wasn't effectively uh, configured for, for central hospitals. And so we found that they were using a lower version, an odd version of, of uh, so DHS1, uh, to try and configure uh, the, hosp uh, the, the hospital uh, or the system to suit the hospital requirements. Uh, but these efforts were at facility level and uh, with um, under-trained and uh, under-skilled staff. And so the result isn't uh, what you'd call an optimal system. And then there was a, a bit of attempts to uh, digitize certain parts of the uh, uh, hospital or management function system. For example, the OPD, uh, ART, uh, the uh, pharmacy, uh, the lab. Yeah, but these also, uh, these digital systems are independent, uh, poorly, in, in many cases, not well conceptualized and uh, uh, are not useful beyond the immediate, immediate department or program. Uh, and then crossing to the administrative systems, I think what we found was uh, infamous, uh, I, most of you will be familiar with, uh, but also without connections to the service uh, delivery information, information. And so you can't make sense of uh, how good, uh, or, or, or make sense of, 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 of information around efficiency, equity, and accessibility of services. Uh, uh, and uh, how efficient uh, uh, production of services is at the hospital. Uh, uh, similarly, the, the human resource management information system remained uh, largely paper-based and digitized only at a very high level, uh, at national level. So, yeah, so in summary, uh, 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 based on the assessment of the St. Hospital uh, management information system and where that covers all these systems. Uh, uh, so we found uh, weak uh, uh, data collection and reporting processes. Uh, and essentially, we, we, we argued this was due to uh, overreliance on paper-based data collection and aggregation. And then uh, uh, the, for, for moving towards digitizing, which was to, uh, a, a natural recommendation, we also uh, found that this will require uh, a rethink of the uh, 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 architecture uh, and, and coherence across across the data systems. Uh, but most importantly, the digital solutions that were uh, introduced to try and, uh, and navigate around uh, the challenges of paper, uh, we also did not find uh, uh, of course, it might require uh, a bit more uh, well-designed studies uh, as with our Ugandan colleagues. But we, consideratively, we did not find evidence or also talking to the staff. One, there was limited use and uh, pointing towards a uh, lack of uh, appreciation of value from the uh, 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 users. Uh, and this was largely also due to the extremely narrow range of uh, information that were, they were reporting. And we attributed this to uh, a, a, a top-down uh, process where upstream players demand the information they need from central hospitals. And so uh, the hospitals were overwhelmed with reporting upwards, uh, and there's very little uh, chance for them to use it, to, to decide on which information uh, they need to make decisions at the hospital. Uh, yeah, there were other uh, issues, uh, and I also probably come to the issue of uh, uh, political economy uh, with digital health adop adop adoption. Yeah, so in general, uh, the main uh, uh, recommendation, which is something we're trying to work with our colleagues in the ministry, is to start thinking around conceptual uh, the architecture uh, framework uh, within which all the uh, 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 digital uh, 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 digital health innovations 
could then be harnessed. Uh, at the moment, each program uh, identifies its needs and then moves on to identify its digital solutions. But these eventually are collecting, uh, at least as, uh, as you'd expect, it's, it's, it would be the same uh, community health workers, the same hospital management. So they are replicating information uh, that are getting at, at, at least across levels and for patients. Uh, so an architecture or design uh, uh, with uh, dimensions of patient care, uh, care support, quality management, hospital administration and finance, and also which allows uh, interaction with uh, outside outside uh, data data system service and external data. Uh, it's something that we 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 thinking could could help uh, rationalize what what tools currently are available are useful for what purpose and which tools, for example, would need to be uh, uh, sustained and and big decisions around which tools, for example, you need to drop because uh, rather than bringing efficiency in the process, they are bringing. Uh, 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 they are requiring uh, a, a, a lot of time uh, from staff, and uh, they are not useful beyond beyond the, the immediate programs. And most importantly, uh, a process uh, I'll, I'll highlight later on, which also uh, uh, speaks more towards the first presentation, the theoretical presentation on digital health, uh, about identifying what decisions each level makes, and for those decisions, what information would then be ideal to support uh, uh, decision processes at those levels. So, so in that sense, more moving towards, uh, uh, here we, we're talking about the St. Hospital, doing the same thing for the district hospitals, doing the same thing for community hospitals, doing the same thing for uh, uh, health centers. And, and as I'll show, uh, there's already a process for the community level. Uh, and also at each level, at each level, going to customize for the needs of each uh, administrative entity. Uh, that's kind of the uh, uh, vision that we're trying to advocate. Uh, so, but what are the challenges? Uh, so I'll go through one big challenge, uh, which I think uh, uh, requires probably attention of uh, economists and planners. So, uh, this is a challenge of uh, ad, 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 ad adoption of the technologies. Uh, I, most of the technologies, are, 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 as you know, are supported by partners uh, uh, who come via a program. And uh, where the competences for cost effectiveness uh, are limited. And so uh, we've gotten to where it's difficult to so they can come and press a technology can come and replace the technology and in four or five years down the line you find that you're still uh, uh, repeating the same thing that they are not technology that you replaced uh, uh, the same challenges that you uh, thought you are uh, addressing yeah so the community health information system uh, uh, aims to monitor the community health strategy, which is to be implemented between 2017 and 2022. Uh, as, uh, uh, and so uh, it prescribed the uh, community health information strategy as a main uh, a digital platform that should, that should be developed to monitor uh, the uh, community health strategy. And so what, what has happened so far is that the DITRI International has uh, uh, facilitated uh, uh, a situation analysis for the community health strategy, community health information system. They've done workflow assessments and then systems requirements. Uh, so far, these processes have been concluded. Uh, based on the above processes, MOH is currently uh, deliberating on which application they should uh, adopt. And so, uh, uh, uh conducted an assessment of uh, five, uh, seven, uh, seven, seven, seven uh, applications, Comcare, CHD, I think I want DHIS2, uh, Logic, Open, SRP, Rapid Pro, and ODK. Uh, who focus on the two, DHIS2 and Open, SRP. So, uh, 
So the categories for, for assessment included whether uh, the application is open source, whether there's a community of practice, uh, whether it can support care uh, or cross management processes, if it's interoperable with other systems, it's got offline capability, uh, it's proven capability, uh, uh, development and maintenance costs, uh, a mobile app capability, local hosting capability, and data analysis capability. Uh, across the, these dimensions, they were scoring up to five. Uh, uh, if you not, uh, maybe uh, for because of time, I will move quickly. Based on the uh, uh, broad categories, uh, Summarizing across, summing across all the categories, uh, you see that DHIS2 outperformed all the uh, uh, applications. Now, DHIS2 is a system that's already in use. It's in use at central hospitals, as I pointed out. It's in use at DC hospitals. It's used uh, uh, more recently, it's been adopted uh, uh, in the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, 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 Department of Nutrition. And I also know of uh, EP and D uh, that are, are using it. Uh, now, uh, to arrive at a decision, the ministry uh, 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 reviewed the uh, uh, DITRI report, uh, which recommended uh, which recommended DHS2. Uh, but uh, probably based on dissatisfaction with the current DHS2 configuration, they then um, uh, added uh, uh, additional additional criteria on the basis so complexity and flexibility on the basis of this uh, if you not uh, they then recommended uh, uh, an application which wasn't available which isn't uh, in use yet but on the basis that it had capability for extended uh, 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 it, one, the tools could be extended uh, uh, for, uh, could be customized. And then uh, the uh, code, the, the, applica the code, application code can also be extended to cover new functionality. So on the basis of this, they, the, uh, the assessment uh, on the, the multiple criteria was then overruled uh, to, Oh, to recommend to recommend open SRP, although uh, uh, it performed not so good, it was number three on on here. Uh, yeah, but on the account that uh, it provided uh, avenues for uh, new functionality. Uh, we talked to the data experts. Uh, Investor of my Chancellor College uh, to check whether. Uh, uh, so obviously they agreed with the previous uh, assessment, the, the, the objective assessment, and then to check whether uh, this uh, 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 qualitative assessment uh, they would agree with. They protested and argued that in fact the point number three, which was uh, judged as a weakness, the main weakness for DHS2 was actually strength. Okay. So uh, what does that suggest? Maybe we needed uh, a bit more uh, additional criteria. Uh, uh, in our case, we're thinking this is, this provides scope for cost effectiveness uh, 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 work in a particular adoption, uh, deci deciding which technology to adopt. And in the, in a, akin to how uh, our technology adoption uh, is handled in medicines and, and, and that, Diagnostics. We think this should also be the case for, 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 for uh, instances where we are uh, confronted with the decision to uh, choose between two technologies. Uh, yeah. So uh, broader, uh, based on 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 these uh, two uh, reviews, I think the key recommendations, uh, which are also covered by uh, DITRI, and we've just extended them to the entire HMIs. Uh, would be to strengthen digital health leadership, uh, clearly define and communicate the HMIs. Uh, 
in line with UHC reporting requirements for all levels, and then conduct uh, critical and thorough reviews of, of the HMIS in terms of scope and implementation approach. And uh, 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 we're also pushing that countries should should have uh, uh, should, should attempt to localize uh, to institutionalize capacity, uh, uh, including also attempting to finance. That will give a bit more or, or, or independence in terms of or, or, uh, deciding or when to adopt or not. And then, uh, uh, yeah, consider uh, technical and operational requirements as, 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 as you saw in the, in the previous assessment, and then have a strategy in place for managing change. I think this is a bit of a key one because with proliferation of digital health solutions, and if we run them past cost benefit analysis, uh, many of them would, would, would probably fail, but these are uh, uh, heavily funded. In, in, uh, uh, so uh, that could require uh, also uh, processes beyond economics about how you manage, uh, you manage change. Uh, yeah, maybe I think I could end there uh, with two uh, uh, conclusions. That one, probably from our review, we need uh, to think about uh, architectural designs first uh, before we start uh, piecemeal uh, digital uh, uh, solutions adop adop adoption. And then uh, think up through what technologies are already in use, what's the capability, uh, uh, current challenges due to configura configuration uh, limitations, or are they due to the application itself uh, before? And then uh, in moving from the current uh, applications to a new application, uh, what standards should be applied, uh, including in this case, cost benefit analysis? Yeah, thanks so much uh, for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dominic, for that uh, presentation. We're not doing so well in terms of time. I think we, we seem to have run out, but we, we still have one presentation. And I will invite Simon to give that one presentation. And then at the end, I think we will have to cut short on the Q&A at all. So I think let me invite Simon for now to give us the presentation and then we'll see how it goes from there. Uh, brilliant. Thanks, Eddie. Uh, Dominic, could you stop sharing your screen so that I can share my slides, please? Oh, there we go. Great. Hi there. Uh, thanks for having me speak today. So I'm here to talk more generally about the evaluation of digital health interventions. Um, and I'd just like to thank Roz, Martin and Dominic for their interesting presentations today. So in terms of digital health interventions, what do we really mean? As we've already seen today, and as Roz highlighted in their presentation, digital health is a pretty broad catch-all term Used to, used to refer to a very, very broad and diverse set of intervention, interventions at both the individual and system level. And these can range from sort of the much more, I say simple, simpler, but simpler to evaluate sort of patient level interventions. So ones I previously worked on include things such as sort of computerized cognitive behavioral therapy for patients with depression to slightly more complex uh, interventions impacted on, on one service within a healthcare system. As we've seen today, some of the M health technologies used by IDI in Uganda for HIV. And then to the to more complex in, in types of digital interventions which impact the whole system, such as the digitization of a health management information system. Um, and so obviously it's a, it's a big broad catch-all term and different types of interventions are gonna raise different challenges uh, with regards to evaluating them. However, my sort of view as an economist, you know, but there's always one overarching objective of an economic evaluation. And it, it's the same regardless of the complexity of the intervention we're looking at. And that is, does this represent value for money? Are we going to get more of the benefits that we want investing in this than an alternative policy or an alternative intervention um, using those same resources? So this slide focuses on evaluation for informing decision-making more generally. 
Um, but it's equally relevant to digital interventions as it is to any other form of healthcare intervention, which is trying to make demands on the limited healthcare resources available. So, so the first question you ask, so what are the outcomes of interest? What is it with this intervention that we're trying to achieve? You know, is it, are we trying to improve the patient's health? Are we trying to improve the informational flows? Are we trying to reduce waiting lists? You know, what, 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 are the, what is the, what we refer to as the sort of value space of which we are trying to impact? What, you know, what, what is driving the benefit? What do we want to achieve here? Then the next thing we need to ask is, well, so this is the intervention we're interested in, but what else is there which we could use? Now, it isn't typically just introduce this or do nothing. There's other, there, are, there might be other digital apps available. There might be um, non-digital interventions available, which, which could have similar results. And you know, these are all alter, alternative ways that we could expend these limited healthcare resources. And when we're tr trying to make efficient decision making, we need to compare relevant alternatives to see, well, which course of action is the best. Then, which raises the, the next question is one of the more, more complex ones, which is what are the range of intended and unintended consequences each of these alternative course of action, each of these interventions might generate? How, how do we know how this, if we introduce this, how is it going to impact the benefits we want? What's driving that effect? What, what is the size of those benefits? And that's, it's, a, it's a big challenge of measurement. It's a, how do we know what those effects are? And how, how do we estimate them? Similarly to the sort of capturing the benefits, we also need to be able to capture the other side of the equation, which is what, what's it going to cost? What are the impacts on resources of this? Uh, and most importantly, is we're not just simply interested in cost. We're interested in what the, what the opportunity cost of those funds are. If we divert resources to this intervention, we are diverting them from other potentially valuable uses. And we need to know that we're going to get more bang for your buck investing here than you would elsewhere. And this, this, when we bring together the benefits and the cost and opportunity costs, it's so which of the courses of action, which of these set of alternatives we're comparing, so would you introduce digital intervention A, B or C, um, which, which is, has the greatest expected benefit, which one is the, is the best value for money. And that's the sort of standard economic evaluation approach. But a sort of another key issue we have is, well, what about uncertainty? And, and here I'm not just talking about sort of statistical significance and whether oh, we, this achieves a p-value saying it's better than x is better than y. What we're really talking about here is the cost of uncertainty. So it's about whether, what is the chance that we make the wrong decision and how, and if, and if we do make the wrong decision, how much health or of these other benefits are we going to lose as a result? And if we can quantify that, we can look at, well, what about alternative policies before we introduce this? Perhaps we could look at actually doing a study, doing some research to try and reduce that uncertainty so we're better poised to make that decision. What if we roll out this digital intervention in one district within uh, Kampala and not in another? So that we've got, we, can, we can compare the outcomes in the other two to say, well, which, which, which is actually doing better? Um, these are some key challenges in evaluating complex interventions, which are equally important for uh, which would capture many challenges in digital interventions. So briefly touched on the valuation space, what are the outcomes we actually care about? Um, you know, what, what, what do we want to achieve? What are these comparators? There's issues over the timing of the evaluation. Like we don't, you know, it, do we want to evaluate it before we introduce it? Do we want to roll this out slightly and evaluate it at that point? To decide if we want to increase to scale it up or bring it back or to withdraw it? The two slightly complex ones are here in terms of estimating what the, how is this intervention driving through uh, achieving the benefits we want? What are those mechanisms of action? How much do we understand those? What's the sort of dynamic components behind it? And these raise serious issues when you're trying to actually plan plan your research or plan your evaluation to try and understand how this is going, how X is going to lead to Y, and how we can actually try and measure that so that we can say whether this is beneficial or not. Um, talked a bit about resource use and cost, you know, we are always interested in costs and because we, we need to know how much resource this intervention is going to take up and so that we can say, well, if we divert resources there, we're not going to, you know, we're going to have opportunity costs elsewhere within the system. Um, and finally, just particularly with digital intervention and particularly with complex and digital interventions, it's the issue of generalizability of results. 
So quite often, even, even if you have an evaluation, say it's in, say you've got an evaluation in one country, is that are the results of that transferable to another healthcare system, which is very different? Are the results even transferable within within a country? If you implement a digital intervention in a city where you've got a high number of people who've got mobile phones, or is it going to be have the same sort of impact in a rural area? It's, it's important to consider these challenges when you're saying, well, we're going to, if we're going to scale this up further, what, how do we have to translate the evidence we have to say what the value for money is elsewhere? Um, some of the further ones just picked up today in terms of a few things. Quite a lot, one of the key things about digital interventions is they quite often involve large upfront investment costs, whether that be in develop, developing a system or with the digitalization of health to the, uh, discussed today, you know, digitalization of health information, you know, it's very, it'd be very up, large upfront investment to actually bring in a system where you digitize everything, which raises issues about sort of large upfront investment and, and potentially sunk costs, which you're not going to be able to achieve. If you decide to then withdraw it because it's not really working, you can't get that money back. You've spent it already. So it, it leaves some quite, comes up, you know, it, it needs to be considered in your evaluation. In terms of, you know, but, but however, it can also potentially release uh, valuable resources for other purposes. You know, some VM health technologies we've seen today would, would be beneficial in terms of um, releasing uh, physician and nurse time in clinics to potentially be used more valuably targeted at, at more uh, patients with more complex HIV. Um, so it would you know, potentially generate more health than they are currently where they're being used on more routine, easier patients. Um, and then one of the key things about digital health and which has been touched upon in several of the presentations today is that it generate, it's special in a way that actually digital health inherently generates evidence which can be used for further research and for better decision making. And that, I still think, is, is an under-researched area about that, the poten potential of that data, which doesn't necessarily impact the current decision or the decision to in introduce this intervention, but could impact loads of future decisions because we've got better understanding of how patients act, of their health, of the consequences of it. Um, in terms of evaluation, there are many challenges. However, they're not unique necessarily to digital interventions. Um, we'd heavily argue the need for multidisciplinary research. Economics on its own hasn't got the answer, quantitative methods haven't got the answer, to actually fully understand how these digital interventions impact on health and the healthcare system requires research, uh, requires research across the spectrum and then being able to bring that together to help inform decision makers about whether introducing it is better than not introducing it. And there's still a large amount of scope for further methods development within the area, um, which we are hoping to do under, under Tansy and other programmes in York. Uh, thanks, for, thanks very much for your time. Yeah, thank you very much, Simon, for, for that uh, presentation. Now, like I said, we have exceeded our allotted time, so there won't be much time for, for, for discussion. What I propose to do here, I'm going to take one intervention from a participant, and uh, I will invite Julie Jemtai to uh, ask a question to our panelists, and we'll, we'll get answers, and then we'll close there. So Judy. Hello, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, okay, um, <laughs> I have that question. I, uh, I think this will be going to either Ma Martin or Dominic. Um, so we know that uh, HMIS are, are generally poorly funded uh, by government. Uh, what motivation can the hospitals have in implementing the systems in the already constrained uh, resource, resources environment uh, and already excessive workloads uh, in compiling data from the record teams, and they have to do this from different departments. Um, and this, all of this is in the context of uh, other duties such as clinical and patient care. Um, I think it's a huge, uh, huge burden there. Um, can I throw in the second question? I'll let that go. The same. Since you have the floor, I yes, you can. Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, so the second one that I had um, is uh, based on evidence from the other countries, uh, specifically uh, some of the work that we've done here in Kenya. 
um, it shows that um, sort of implemented electronic systems, uh, generally both um, HMIS and other electronic systems, uh, have focused more, mostly on improving financial or administrative management uh, within the hospital rather than clinical management. Uh, how can this be improved or balanced um, if, if, if the outcome is, is uh, considered similar to both, but what, how can this be improved in terms of uh, reporting and taking up these systems in, in terms of clinical management? Thank you, Over. Right, thank you. So I think this was directed to, to Dominic or Martin. So who would like to, to give a response to that? Um, this is Dr. Martin. Uh, with regard to the first question, so when we're developing our tools, we make sure they are interoperable with the ministry HMIA system such that we reduce on the fatigue of um, using multiple systems to capture data. So we work closely with the EMR stock HMIS teams to make sure that um, there's bi bilateral communication between our systems and picking variables that would have otherwise been duplicated. Yeah, Dominic here on, yeah, so almost like we take a different approach. So I think what we're doing with the ministry, uh, also learning from um, the application of the JHS2 in agriculture is that, uh, it's possible to configure using the DHS2 tracker. It's possible to configure the DHS2 uh, as a, a clinical decision uh, 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 support uh, tool initially before uh, thinking of it as a data reporting tool. So uh, there's work uh, by Chancellor College uh, uh, IT department where they've configured the whole health center, uh, almost replaced uh, uh, data processes by up to 90 something percent. And we've also seen a similar uh, 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 pattern with the culture management information system, which is based on the DHS2. So where they're using uh, extensively the DHS2 tracker to, uh, uh, to, to program the transactions that happen at the facility and then uh, build dashboards, decision dashboards for each level of care. So in this case, for example, that's how I see the balance between uh, 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 the administrative side, the financial side, and the clinical side of m and coming uh, 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 into play. Uh, I, I think I, 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 I uh, relate to the problem because which, which has been the criticism here to the extent that uh, we've thought it was the platform that was a problem, but the problem isn't the platforms. The problems are conceptualizations, and uh, uh, and these are confounded when uh, 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 solutions come now to address specific uh, challenge of DHS2 in the specific area. So I think this is kind of something that we uh, uh, working or at least concurrently with the ministry to see which would represent an optimal approach. Is it each tool gets developed and then you achieve interoperability? or you extend the DHS2 to cover as many areas as possible, and then uh, optimally uh, focus on, on, on uh, uh, tools that just add value. So yeah, sure, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Dominic and, uh, and Martin for those uh, responses. I think it's now uh, five minutes past the hour, and uh, I would like now to bring uh, the, the webinar to a close in the interest of time. And uh, let me thank our participants, not many today, but uh, those of you who managed to join and they still actively participate. I know I may have uh, prevented some of you from making comments, but I think it's due to the time constraints. But nevertheless, I thank you for attending. Let me also thank our presenters, our four presenters for the good presentations. Unfortunately, we couldn't discuss this in more detail, but I think this has been very good. Thank you very much to you all. And of course, the team that helped organize this. Thank you very much to you. So I will now bring the webinar to a close. Uh, thank you very much. I hope to see you again next week when we have another topic. Thank you very much. Thank you.